Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you again, at least in two dimensions. Someday soon, we should see each other in three dimensions. Uh, and we have a really interesting program tonight. Tonight is Yom HaShoah. And it is a day that we annually remember the Holocaust. However, it did occur to me that Maybe, although we make a point of remembering it once a year, and the Brotherhood has made a point of remembering Yom HaShoah for as many years as I can remember, but a long, long time, and we will, I'm sure, continue to do so. I think it's also important to remember that it gets every year a little bit longer away from 1945. And less and less people are here that have firsthand knowledge of what happened. And even more important in today's world where people shy away from <clears throat> talking about things that make them uncomfortable, it doesn't get the airtime that it needs to get. So although we specifically remember it just today, it's not a bad idea to keep the show off, if not top of mind, at least on our mind, all year long. And with that, I will turn you over to Fred Volfer, who has a, an affinity for this topic. Fred? Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> I, I have an affinity for this topic, yes. Uh, welcome to the Temple Brother uh, 2021 presentation for Yoma Shoa. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speaker, uh, Tim Boyce. Tim uh, practiced law for many years, most recently serving as a managing partner uh, in the Charlotte office of Deckert LLP, a global law firm. Tim holds an MBA from the Wharton School of Finance and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. He received a BS from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Tim lives in Tryon, North Carolina with his wife, Tara, Two horses, two dogs, two cats. I had a joke there and I won't say it. And almost 5,000 books. Uh, he retired in 2014 to devote full-time speaking and writing of what he's gonna be talking about tonight. Tim has written a book from day to day, uh, One Man's Diary of Survival of Nazi Concentration Camps about a gentleman named Odd Nansen. As the second generation survivor, the publication of books like this and presentations of people like Tim are so important to me, uh, to my family, and to so many Holocaust survivors and Jews as a, as a nation so that we shouldn't forget and that we can continue to tell the story. Uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal, uh, who I heard make this quote said, it would be lost to history if people like Tim did not devote their time effort and expense for a good part of their life to preserve the history of Odd Nansen. Uh, just a couple of rules as we go through this. Uh, Q&A will be done only through the chat box. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please send your questions through chat. And Bishop Sheen, my wingman tonight, and he really is, we are in the same room, uh, will, will hand me questions and I will ask Tim the questions so that we can uh, make this go smoother. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to our speaker tonight, Tim Boyce. Well, great. Thank you so much, Fred, for that very nice introduction. It is quite an honor for me to mm -hmm. be sharing your Holocaust commemoration uh, tonight with all of you. And it's also a little bit of a homecoming for me, for even though I now live in Tryon, North Carolina, which is about maybe a 90 minute drive west of Charlotte. I did live in Charlotte for a good 10 years from 2004 to 2014. So I really feel this is a bit of a homecoming. So as you have said, I'm gonna be talking about a gentleman named Odd Nansen and a diary that he kept while he was a prisoner in different concentration camps. And if you'll give me one second, I'll pull up my PowerPoint and we can begin. Okay, so there's my PowerPoint. So I'd like to begin actually by telling you all a story. And I'd like you to participate with me, at least vicariously in this story, by imagining you're kind of a, part, a participant in this. First of all, I'd like you to all imagine that you are once again a 10-year-old child. 
Second, I'd like you all to imagine that the date is January 1945. And third, I'd like you all to imagine that instead of waking up in a nice cozy bed and a nice cozy house in Charlotte or Mint Hill or uh, one of the surrounding communities or here Tryon, imagine that you find yourself waking up in a concentration camp and not just any concentration camp, a camp called Auschwitz. And the guards have just come into your barracks and they're screaming and shouting and bellowing the command, Rouse, Rouse. Rouse, as some of you may know, is a German word that means out. Everybody out, we're evacuating this camp. So you line up outside your barracks, you join this marching column that is already miles long. You make your way out through the front gate onto these back roads. And for the next three days, you're gonna march in this column through the snow and the ice and the slush and the mud in bitterly, bitterly cold temperatures as only Eastern Europe can be in January. And then on the third day, you reach a rail junction, at which point you're put on a train, a train that consists exclusively of cattle cars. Now cattle cars have four sides, but they have no roof, they have no heat, they have no plumbing, they have no protection from the elements. And you spend the next 10 days in that cattle car as this train slowly makes its way out of Southwestern Poland, takes a long southerly detour through Czechoslovakia, and finally turns north into Germany and comes to a stop about 25 miles north of Berlin at yet another concentration camp, this one called Sachsenhausen. And when you get to Sachsenhausen, you're grateful that you're still even alive. Thousands of people died in just that two week period, in what became known in history as the Auschwitz Death March. But as I mentioned, you, you're one of the lucky ones, you're one of the survivors. But that doesn't mean that you're not hurting at this point. It doesn't mean you're not suffering as well. In fact, by the time you get to Sachsenhausen, you can barely walk into the camp under your own power. You've got terrific pains in both of your feet. But up until now on this 14 day odyssey that you've been on, you dare not take off your boots to see what's wrong with your feet for a variety of reasons, including the fear that someone larger and stronger than you will steal your boots if you take them off. I mean, by January, 1945, the world really is a dog eat dog place. But now that you're finally in Zaxenhausen, take off your boots, boots now, again, you've been wearing for, for two weeks continuously to see what's wrong with your feet. And you see that you're suffering from a severe case of frostbite. In fact, so severe that your feet have turned black and the flesh on your toes is already beginning to rot. So you know you have to get some kind of medical attention. I mean, that's the logical thing to do. In the infirmary in these uh, concentration camps, the German word for the infirmary was the Revier. You know you have to go to the Revier. As I said, that's, that's logical. That's what you and I do when we get sick or injured, we, we get some medical attention. But in the crazy upside down illogical world of the concentration camp, the Revier was actually considered to be one of the most dangerous places you could visit. The prisoners called it the waiting room for the gas chamber. Because if you think about it, if you're lying in a bed, by definition, you're not working. If you're not working, you're not contributing. If you're not contributing, why should the camp uh, expend any resources on trying to keep you alive? I mean, after all, every single prisoner is completely expendable. You die, just another nameless prisoner is gonna take your place anyways. But you also know that if number one, even if you could ignore this constantly gnawing pain that you have in your feet, you know that if you don't get any medical attention, you're gonna get either gangrene or sepsis, in which case you're gonna die anyways. So you screw up your courage, you report to the infirmary, the Revier, and luckily for you, there's a kindly doctor on duty that day. He was a fellow prisoner, he's not a, not a Nazi doctor. He takes one look at your feet, immediately picks you up, carries you over to a, an operating table. Remember, you're only a 10 year old child. And the next thing you know, he's giving you a whiff of ether, knocks you unconscious. And the next thing you know after that is you're suddenly coming back to consciousness. You look around, you see that you're now lying in a bed in the Revier. You look down at your feet and you see that both of them are heavily bandaged. And the orderlies in that hospital ward explained to you that the doctor had to amputate some of your toes. Now, at this point, you're wondering, 
well, how long can I stay in a hospital bed? I mean, what happens if a Nazi doctor walks in and sees me at this point? You know, you know what he's going to say. He's going to say, what are we doing using up a, a precious hospital bed for a 10-year-old child? You know what to do with somebody like that. In the meantime, prisoners, hundreds if not thousands of prisoners, are streaming through the Riviera at all hours of the day and night. You know, by the spring of 1945, Sachsenhausen had a prisoner population somewhere north of 35,000 prisoners. You know, it was the size of a, of a large town. And these prisoners are coming in for various reasons, some to get some medical attention, some to um, uh, see their friends who are sick, some just to get out of the cold. And all these people who are coming into the Riviera have one thing in common, which is they're not paying the slightest attention to you. And after all, they don't know who you are. You're not from their village. You're not part of their extended family. So why should they care about you? Why should they spend any, any of their energy worrying about a stranger who's just arrived from Auschwitz who they don't even know? But then one day, a middle-aged man walks into the infirmary. And instead of walking right by you, like everyone else has up to this point, this person stops. He starts talking to you. He starts asking you questions. A child, what's your name? Where did you come from? How did you get into Zaxenhaus? And what were you doing before that? Do you know where your parents are? Do you have any brothers and sisters? In fact, do you know anybody here in Zaxenhausen at all? In other words, this one individual is showing some interest in you and in your plight. So let me tell you what this story is all about. First, here's a copy of the diary, which we're going to talk about from day to day. But the reason why I was telling you that story, there's several reasons why I told you that story. The first reason is that it's actually a true story. The child that I've just been describing was a boy named Thomas Bergenthal. Here's a picture of Tommy, taken in 1938 when he's all of four years old. Now, Tommy would be taken captive along with his mother and father in the fall of 1939 and remain a captive of the Nazis for the entire duration of World War II for no other crime other than the fact that he was a Jew. And the person who stopped to talk to him in that Riviere was a Norwegian named Odd Nansen. Now, the second reason why I'm telling you this story is that this chance meeting, this accidental intersection of these two lives in January or early February, 1945, changed both of their lives. Now, in Tommy's case, it literally meant the difference between life and death, between living and dying. Because from that day forward, Nansen used his food and tobacco rations to bribe the orderlies in that hospital ward to look out for young Tommy, to protect him, to make sure his name did not show up on the selection list, which was constantly being filled out to move prisoners out of the Riviere and into the gas chamber. Now, some of you may be wondering to yourself, how did Nansen have enough food that he could be using it as a bribe to keep him, keep young Tommy alive? I thought everybody in these camps was on the verge of starvation. Well, that's not really a completely accurate picture of what life in these large concentration camps was like. To understand this, what you have to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, is the way the Nazis viewed the world was through the lens of race. To them, race somehow explained how the world worked and race in turn guided how they would treat the world. And of course, the Nazis believed that they belonged to the, to the Herrenenvok, the, the master race, the race that was gonna destined to rule this new world order that they were creating and conquered Europe. At the bottom of the totem pole, of course, the Nazis put the Jews, who they considered to be nothing more than Untermenschen, subhuman. But the Nazis had to find a place in this pecking order for every race. I mean, we would consider them to be generally nationalities, but they considered them to be distinct races. So they would know how to deal with them. And the Nazis looked at the Scandinavian prisoners, both the Norwegians and the Danes. And they said, in many ways, you are racially akin to us. You're almost like our, our first cousins racially. I mean, after all, you're tall, you're blonde haired, you're blue eyed. I mean, you could, you could almost fit the, the Aryan ideal but you're not Germanic, so you can't be on the same par with us, but we're gonna put you essentially one notch below us on this pecking order. And by virtue of the relatively exalted position that the Nazis held the Scandinavians in, racially speaking, which was the most important way, of course, 
they allowed them one benefit in these concentration camps that they did not allow to any other prisoners. And that is they allowed him to receive food parcels from the Red Cross. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that this uh, chance meeting changed both their lives. If you think about it, there's not really too much that a 10 year old child who has just had some of his toes amputated can possibly do to help a grown man who is in actually in relatively good shape. That's of course, physically speaking. But I think if you read Nansen's diary, you have to come to the conclusion, just kind of reading between the lines, that by the spring of 1945, that Nansen was heading for a mental breakdown. Yeah, physically he was doing okay, but mentally he was kind of in this downward spiral. You know, by this time he had been in concentration camps for over three years. He was arrested in January, 1942. He had seen every kind of cruelty, every kind of barbarity imaginable. And every time he thought things can't get any worse, of course, they would always manage to get even worse. And so this is what Nansen wrote about meeting Tommy. He wrote this uh, in his, after the war. And he wrote, everywhere I went in the camp, Tommy's angelic face popped up. Without suspecting it, Tommy accomplished us a work of salvation. He touched something in us, which was about to disappear. He called to life again, human feelings, which were painful to have but which nevertheless meant salvation for us all. So meeting Tommy kind of pulled Nansen out of this mental tailspin. The third reason why I'm telling you this story is that that chance meeting between these two people changed my life. Now, of course you can see, I'm not old enough to have even been alive during World War II. And it would take 60 years for that event, for the meeting between these two people to intersect with my life and change it forever. So, you can see by looking over my shoulder, I'm speaking to you from my library here in my house in Tryon. And almost every book you see behind me is a history book. I'm a voracious reader of history. I find it infinitely fascinating. Like sometimes I think I should have uh, been a historian rather than practice law for 35 years. I probably would have been happier. So I'm always on the lookout for interesting stories, whether they're histories, biographies, memoirs, so going back 11 years ago now to the year 2010, I wandered into a bookstore in Charlotte because I was living in Charlotte at that point. I can't remember exactly where it was. I think it was a Barnes and Noble. And I went right to the history section, which is what I would always do. And I saw this new book on the bookshelf, a book called A Lucky Child written by somebody named Thomas Bergenthal. Now I had never seen this book before, it had just been published in the year 2010. Well, and I never I knew nothing about it. But when I saw that subtitle, A Memoir of Surviving Auschwitz as a Young Boy, that's what caught my eye. And I thought this, this has got to be a fascinating story. So I bought this book on nothing more than an impulse, just based on that subtitle, and took it home and started reading it. And by the way, of course, that picture of the young boy on the left is a picture of Tom Bergenthal shortly after he was liberated in the spring of 1945. And as I read this book, I learned the story that I just related to you, how Tommy ends up in Auschwitz, how he takes part in the evacuation. He arrives in Sachsenhausen with frostbitten feet. He has some of his toes amputated from frostbite, and then he meets Odd Nansen. And at that point in Tommy's memoir, he says, by the way, this, this Norwegian named Odd Nansen, who I credit with saving my life in Sachsenhausen, he kept a diary. And then Tom adds just one footnote on the bottom of page 177. I think you can all read it on your screens. It's nothing more than a description of this diary that he's mentioned up in the text. Gives the name of it from day to day. The date it was published in America in 1949 and the publisher, G.P. Putnam. And so when I was reading this book and I came to this footnote, I thought to myself, well, Tom Bergenthal's memoir has been really one of the most fascinating books I've ever read. Maybe this diary would be equally interesting. I've, I've never heard of it. I've never heard of this fellow named Odd Nansen who wrote it. Uh, in fact, I, at that point, I probably couldn't have told you almost anything about Norway's experience during World War II. But again, when you have this many history books, buying another memoir, another diary is the easiest thing in the world. I mean, the bar is set as, as low as possible. So I decided, okay, I'm going to find this, see if I can find this diary. I know I'm not going to be able to go into Barnes and Noble or Park Road Books to find it, I'm gonna to have to go where? On the internet, of 
course. If people anywhere in the world are selling something, they're putting their wares on the internet. And of course, I've bought many out of print books uh, through the internet. So I know the websites, the best websites to visit. So I, I began my search and I was able to locate one single copy of this book, of this diary for sale in the entire United States. There was only one copy for sale in the year 2010 in the United States. It was a bookseller in the state of Washington. Now I found two more books for sale in uh, Great Britain, one in Australia and one in New Zealand, five in the entire globe. That's it. Where all the other copies had disappeared between 1949 and 2010 is anyone's guess. So I ordered one of those books. It was, I actually bought it from the bookseller in New Zealand. And when it arrived, I started reading it. And within a very short period of time, maybe a week, 10 days, at most two weeks, I was completely smitten by this book. I mean, I, I just thought it was really one of the, a masterpiece, one of the best books I had ever read in my entire life. It was above any book I've got on the bookshelf here behind me. And what kept, the thought kept occurring, even before I finished this book and recurring to me is, how can it be that this book, which has swept me off my feet, which I think is really a masterpiece, how can it be that no one else has seen fit in the last 60 plus years to republish this book? And again, I don't know the answer to that, but if you think about it, if there's five copies of this book available for sale in the entire globe, the chances of anybody even finding it, and discovering it and stumbling upon it and doing something about it is statistically almost infinitesimal. So I decided that I would get this book back into print. Now, I also made another uh, decision at that point back in 2010, which was that in, rather than just retype this old 1949 copy and, and put a new cover on it, slap a new cover on it, try to get it published, that I would take advantage of the fact that I had 60 years of hindsight, I had the power of the internet to do a lot of investigative work on this diary. So I decided I would become the editor of it as well. I would explain who are all these people that Nonsense in prison with? Did they survive the war? If they did, what did they do after the war? What about all these different places that Nonsense moved to, these different camps? What about all these rumors that Nonsense hears through the grapevine while he's in prison? You know, he learns about the massacre at the Katyn Forest or the Battle of Stalingrad or Operation Torch. If you're not really an ex a World War II expert, some of this stuff may not make a whole lot of sense to you. So I decided I would annotate it. And after six years of research and also six years of find looking for publishers and getting many re rejections along the way, Vanderbilt University Press uh, agreed to publish the now fully annotated uh, version of this diary. So what I'd like to do and spend my time with you tonight is give you an idea of the kind of the who, what, where, when the, about this diary. And more importantly, even, uh, I'd like you to focus on the unique character of Odd Nonsen, the diarist. So let's get, let's get started. Let's talk about who Odd Nonsen was. Well, here's a picture of the Nonsen family in the spring of 1902. And since Nansen, Odd Nansen was born in December of 1901, you can surmise that he is the young child in his mother's arms in the center of that picture. As you can tell, he's the fourth child born to his parents. His mother's name was Eva Sars Nansen, and his father's name was Fritjof Nansen. Now, both of his parents came from fairly well-to-do uh, families in Norway. Both of his parents were themselves very accomplished. They were both very artistic. His mother was both an artist and a singer, and his father was a very good artist as well. Unfortunately for Nansen, his mother died when he was only six years old, 1907, of pneumonia. So Nansen was pretty much single-handedly raised by that gentleman who is standing in the upper right-hand corner of this picture, Friedrich Nansen. And although the name Fritjof Nansen really doesn't resonate practically with anybody here in the United States, he is considered in Norway to be one of the most famous, if not the most famous person the country has ever produced. He first made his reputation as a polar explorer. He led an expedition when he was only 31 years old to the North Pole. He didn't make it all the way to the North Pole, 
but he broke the prior record, <clears throat> excuse me, by about 150 miles and more, more importantly, brought everybody back alive. That established him as a kind of an international celebrity. Then in his 40s, Nansen became something of a statesman. He helped Norway achieve its independence from Sweden in 1905. <clears throat> and when Norway became independent, it wanted to have a new king. Obviously, it did no, no longer want to have the king of Sweden to be their monarch. And so they identified a candidate in Denmark, Prince Karl, and they decided that the best person to go to Denmark to convince this prince to become the king of this foreign country, Norway, would be Odd Nansen. And Odd Nansen met with Prince Karl and must have been very persuasive because Prince Karl agreed to become the king of this newly independent country, took on the title Hakon VII. And then in his 50s, Fridtjof Nansen went on to yet another career as a humanitarian. After World War I, he was the first high commissioner for refugees under the newly formed League of Nations. And he did such a good job for the League of Nations in a variety of humanitarian tasks that he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1922. So you can see this man has accomplished in one lifetime more than three people could have accomplished in, in their lifetimes. But growing up in a country like Norway, which at that point had a population of about 3 million people, with a father that, that famous is both a blessing and a curse. Because everybody knows you as the son, strictly as the fact that your father is the, the, the great Fridtjof Nansen. So just to go over some of the facts, as I mentioned, Nansen's born in 1901 in December. In 1927, he graduates from college with a degree in architecture because he is very artistic and we're gonna see some of the artwork, some of the sketches that he drew while he was in prison. And as soon as he has his degree in architecture, he marries his sweetheart, a woman named Kari Hirsch. The name might lead you to believe she was Jewish, she was not. And as soon as he's got his diploma in the one hand and his new bride in the other, he, le he leaves Norway, he comes to America lives in Brooklyn, New York, and practices as an architect in New York City. He was very successful as an architect. And he does this for three years until 1930, when he gets word that his father, Fritjof, is having health issues. He's not doing very well. In fact, he's kind of slowly declining in health. So Nansen takes his family, his uh, wife and his first child, Marit, who was born in Brooklyn. They go back to Norway. They arrive in time to say their goodbyes to Fritjof Nansen, who dies in May of 1930. And lo and behold, Nansen decides at that point he doesn't need to return to the United States. And again, I think it's just because this larger than life figure, this person who's kind of overshadowed everybody, including the son, Odd Nansen, is now gone. So Nansen can kind of be his own person. And I think at this point, I, I, I surmise that Nansen probably looked upon his career now that he's returned to Norway with a whole, uh, with a great deal of optimism. You know, he's had some great work experience in America. That's great for him. He's had his first child in America. He wants to have more children, kind of grow his family. He's now back living in, in Oslo with the people he grew up with, his neighbors, his old classmates. Everything looks great, right? But of course, we know that the storm clouds are already beginning to form over Europe. January 1933, Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. He almost immediately begins persecuting the Jews. Many of them flee to Austria. Germany annexes Austria in 1938. Many of those people then flee to Czechoslovakia. In fact, young Tommy Bergenthal was born in Czechoslovakia of parents who had fled Germany to, directly to Czechoslovakia, figuring, well, we'll stay here until this craziness, this madness in, in Germany blows over. And then we'll, of course, we'll all, we'll all move back. And of course, we know how that turned out. So there's a refugee crisis now brewing in Central Europe, primarily in Czechoslovakia. You've got a lot of stateless refugees at that point. They have no place to go. The Czech government, the Czech nation is not particularly hospitable, doesn't want all of these uh, refugees in their country. But these refugees can't travel because they don't have valid passports. They don't have valid passports because they've been denaturalized under the Nuremberg laws of 1936. So a number of prominent Norwegians come to Odd Nansen and they basically say, you know, there's a crisis in Europe and we've thought about how it's gonna be solved. And we've decided you're the person 
who's going to solve this? Because after all, your name is the Nansen name. And so Nansen essentially agrees at this point, somewhat reluctantly, admittedly, to put his career on hold, put his family on hold. And he forms this organization called Nansen Yelpen, which means Nansen Relief. And he opens an office in Prague. And he goes there with the goal of helping these refugees, primarily Jewish refugees, to get visas to come to Norway. And it's an uphill battle because the Norwegian government at the time was very anti-Semitic, as were the governments of almost all the Western powers, you know, Great Britain, France, United States, particularly the United States State Department were all very anti-Semitic at the time. They professed to feel bad about what was happening to the Jews of Central Europe, but they didn't feel quite so bad as to want to change their immigration laws and, and regulations to allow more of these refugees into their countries. So it really, as I say, was an uphill battle for Nansen. But by 1939, when World War II breaks out, Nansen has been successful in bringing about 270 men, women, and children into Norway. So to sum up a little bit about Nansen, we know that number one, he's famous, bearer of the Nansen name, still very famous in, in Norway today. He's educated, he's got a college degree at a time that not that many people went to college. He's artistic, as I've mentioned, and I will show you some of his uh, drawings to show his, his artwork. So, and he's a humanitarian. He's kind of following in his father's footsteps um, as a humanitarian, the man who won the Nobel Peace Prize. So why was Nansen arrested in the first place? I mentioned he was arrested in January, 1942. Well, the Germans invaded Norway in April of 1940. In fact, the anniversary date of their invasion it's coming up in about two days, April 9th. And in fast forward about a year and a half into the occupation of Norway, and the British launched a commando raid in late December 1941. These highly trained British commandos, they land on the coastline, they quickly blow up a number of factories located there. All these factories were involved in the German war effort. And they shoot up, of course, a number of German soldiers who are guarding these factories. And then 24 hours later, 48 hours later, they're back on their ships, they're steaming back to England. And this drove the German overlord of Norway, his name is Joseph Turboven, furious at the British for doing this. And even he was even more upset over the Norwegian government, which was in uh, exile in Great Britain, and the royal family, which was primarily living in exile in Great Britain. Several of the members were also living in exile here in the United States. So what Turboven decided to do, he said, the way I'm going to get back at the Brits and more importantly, get back at the Norwegians and the royal family is I'm going to arrest 20 of the most prominent citizens in the country. And I'm going to hold them as hostages. I'm not going to charge them with a crime. I'm not going to sentence them. I'm basically going to hold them as an insurance policy or as a, as a poker chip uh, in case things get even worse. I have the most important people under my thumb at that point. And Nansen probably was the most famous person on that list. There was 20 hostages in all who were arrested in mid-January 1942. I mean, after all, Nansen, again, bearer of the Nansen name. Number two, it's his father who brought this prince over from, from Denmark back in 1905, who became the king, who was still the king during World War II, King Hawkon. So he's probably the first person on that list of hostages to be picked up and along with the royal physician, the royal chamberlain, people of that nature. So that's why Nansen was picked up, uh, never charged with a crime and never, as I say, never sentenced. It was just kind of, we're gonna hold you for as long as we feel necessary. Now, why did Nansen even write a diary while he was in prison? One of the very, very few diaries, of course, to ever survive uh, anybody experience in the war and of that group of diaries, which I, I, based on my research, is probably no more than two, possibly three dozen of those diaries, only about five of them have ever been translated into English. Well, Nansen writes in his introduction, he says, I never wrote this with the idea that I would publish this. Nansen had been keeping a diary off and on ever since he was a teenager. This was kind of natural for him. And he says, I really wrote it for two reasons. First of all, he says, I wrote it for myself. He says, writing in the diary was, quote, like relieving my mind of all that weighed on it. It became a private manner of forgetting. 
So I think if Nansen could write down, he then didn't have to mentally keep revisiting these, these scenes of horror. It's kind of like when you write your grocery list, when you're going to the grocery store, once you've written down what you're going to get, you don't kind of keep in your mind all the different things. And of course, once you get into the grocery store, all you do is look at your, your list. You know, God help you if you lose your grocery list. Now you have to recreate in your own mind all these different things that you're going to pick up. And Nansen said, the second reason why I wrote the diary was for my wife, Kati. I wanted her to know what was really going on in these camps, what my real experience was. Now he could write her letters that would, went through the, through the camp system to her and she could write letters back. But every letter that went through the camp, of course, was being censored, it was being written, uh, read rather, by somebody else to see what, what they were writing about, make sure they weren't passing on secrets or something. And his wife, Kadi, at least while he was imprisoned in Norway, which he was for about 18 months, could occasionally get permission to come visit him. And here's Nansen's sketch of what he calls the visit. So you can see he's standing behind the barrier, his family's on the other side. But more importantly, standing as close to him as his own wife is a guard who can speak Norwegian, who's listening to the entire conversation. So under those circumstances, what can you possibly say to your spouse that, that really gets to the core of what's going on? So the diary became his way of expressing to her what was going on. In fact, many of his diary entries begin with the words, Dear Kari, listen to what happened today. I've got to write this down while my memory is still fresh. And many of his diary entries end with the words, Good night, Kari. You know, in his mind, it's almost like he's having a, a one way conversation. He's kind of unloading himself uh, onto the pages of his diary to communicate with his wife. Now, those are the two reasons why he mentions in his introduction. But I tend to think, because I read it multiple times, that I think there was actually a third reason why Nansen, if, if not initially a reason to start the diary, a reason to continue to write it, even though he realized that the longer he kept writing it, especially when he got into Sachsenhausen, the chances, the, the danger of being caught and the consequences of being caught were constantly being ratcheted up. In fact, one diarist, a Dutch prisoner is caught with a diary and he's hauled away and no one ever sees him alive again. And I think that third reason was that Nansen began to realize that through this diary, he was bearing witness to the Holocaust as it was occurring in real time. You know, this wasn't something that he was gonna remember years later after the war. He's writing it as it's fresh, as it's occurring from day to day. And whereas almost all the other prisoners in these concentration camps would treat the Jewish prisoners prisoners as, as pariahs, as people you wanted to stay as far away from as possible, because nothing good could come to you if you were a non-Jew from associating with Jews, unless you wanted to get a random beating while they were uh, suffering from a random beating. And yet Nansen wasn't like that. Nansen would actually go to the Jewish barracks, and he would meet with the prisoners there, and he would ask them questions. He would say, you know, what, were you in a different camp before you were in Sachsenhausen? Tell me the conditions of that camp. That's how we learned about Auschwitz and some of these other camps. And he said, what did you do before the war? You know, where did you live? What was your occupation? What was your family life like? And many of these Jews in, in turn would say to him, we know that we'll never get out of this camp system alive. No matter how this war ends, whether Germany wins or loses, we know, what, you know what's in store for us. So you have to be the person to record our stories and tell our stories after the war. So at least somebody knows what happened to us. And so Nansen, through the diary, would talk about, write down these stories of people that he met. He talks about a Jewish builder from Budapest that he befriends. And this Jewish builder explains to him how he was captured in Yugoslavia and marched from Yugoslavia all the way up to Sachsenhausen, a march of 500 miles that begins with a column of 3,000 able-bodied men and ends up with 850 of them actually stepping foot inside of Sachsenhausen, barely alive. And this is what Nansen writes in one of his diary entries about this Jewish builder from Sachsenhausen. And he writes, <clears throat> let me just get it. This is from Monday, December 18th, 1944. And he writes, there's one touching detail I must relate about this man. 
I've given him a few clothes and some cigarettes and some food. He was very anxious to show his gratitude. One day he came to me with a little thing that he wanted to give me as a souvenir. And I had to promise to keep it. It was, he said, the very best thing he owned. He had nothing else. It was one of the cigarettes that he had borrowed from me, now neatly wrapped up in silver paper. I had given him only three that time. I was in rather low water myself. After the war, he added, he would give me the same present in gold and precious stones. Now, why would somebody make such an extravagantly generous offer? Gold and precious stones? I mean, I'm sure what Nansen gave him by way of food and tobacco and, and clothing was important, but I tend to think that this man was showing his gratitude for something that he considered to be even more valuable to him in this camp, and that, because it was even more rare than even food. And that was the gift of friendship, the gift of empathy, of listening. You know, most prisoners are saying, look, don't tell me your sob story. I got enough problems on my own trying to stay alive. I don't need to hear about your problems. But Nansen wasn't like that. He was outer directed. Now, how did Nansen preserve this diary? As I say, very dangerous undertaking. If you're ever caught red handed with it, it could easily have been used to be executed. Well, Nansen writes, he says, writing the diary was not a big challenge to him. He said he would stay up. Nansen was one of these people, much like his father, Fritjof, who could operate on, on practically no sleep at all. He could go to bed at 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, and then get up at 4.30 in the morning and go back to work. And he would use those hours, the late night hours and the early morning hours, when everybody else, in fact, was asleep, to write the diary out. And he said, second of all, once I wrote the pages of this diary, hiding them really wasn't that difficult. He says, I would put it in the one place I knew the Germans would never go to look for it. And that was in the latrine. The Germans never set foot in the latrine. To them, that was just a source of infectious bacteria, something you want to stay as far away from as possible. So the real challenge was getting the pages of the diary out of the camp. Well, as I mentioned, Nansen was a prisoner in Norway for about 18 months. And during those 18 months, if you think about it, Who's the only people bringing food into the camp for these prisoners? They had to bring in food almost on a daily basis. This is way before you have widespread refrigeration. Who's the workmen who are bringing the building supplies? The Nazis had to keep building more and more barracks to, to house all the Norwegian prisoners that they kept arresting. Well, who's delivering all this? Norwegian civilians. The only people coming into the camp are fellow Norwegians. And the people on the other side of the barbed wire, the prisoners, after all, they're their cousins, their neighbors, their in-laws, their friends. So everybody was willing to help the prisoners smuggle out notes, cards, messages to their spouses, their loved ones, their families, whatever. So, it, and they had a number of ingenious methods of doing this. I could go on for, for another half hour on all the different ways that they would use to smuggle these various things out. And so Nansen was able to smuggle out the entire portion of his diary in, in increments uh, while he was a prisoner in, in uh, Norway. And then in the summer of 1943, Nansen gets in trouble with the commandant. The commandant uh, thought a practical joke that he had played was actually a very much more serious security breach. And so he says, I'm gonna send you now to a real concentration camp, a camp in Germany. And you should tell your family to put up a headstone because you're not coming back from this experience. So Nansen is sent down to Sachsenhausen. He arrives on October 6th, 1943. And when he gets there, he says, I don't know how I'll ever get the pages of this diary out of Sachsenhausen. I mean, I'm now in the middle of the dead center of an enemy country where no one is sympathetic to my plight. But psychologically, it's become so important for me to keep writing this for all the reasons that I mentioned before about kind of washing your mind clean of these of your experiences. He says, I'm just going to keep writing this and hoping against hope that somehow I will think of some way to get this diary out of this camp before the war is over. Over, And if I can't think of any way to get this diary out when the war ends, assuming that, uh, of course, being optimistic here, that I'm still alive, I will bury the entire diary in the ground rather than destroy it. I guess, I guess with the idea that he would then come back after the war and retrieve it. 
and diaries have been found buried at other concentration camps, primarily in Auschwitz, to believe it. Over the, it seems like every decade, about every 10 years, another diary or, or parts of a diary are found buried in the ground in Auschwitz. So other people were thinking the same, the same thing he was thinking. But then nonsense is finally one day I, I had a brainstorm and I realized that even though I and all my fellow prisoners, we were searched every time we left the camp to go to work, by, by this time Sachsenhausen is so small and it was so overcrowded with prisoners that all the work had to be done outside the confines of the, the camp itself. So he says, when we left the camp through the gates, we were searched. At night when we came back in, we were searched. And he says, we realized after a while that what the Germans were primarily concerned with were weapons. They were worried about prisoners somehow getting their hands on weapons, smuggling them into the camp, and then stockpiling them, and then staging an, an uprising. I mean, there weren't that many guards there, given the number of, in, in relationship to the number of prisoners. And there had been uh, uprisings at other concentration camps. There was one in there was one in uh, Auschwitz, there was one in Sobibor, there was one in Treblinka. So this is what the guards were worried about. And he says, as a result, we realized that the guards didn't pay too much attention to the few accoutrements that we had, um, that got us through uh, our daily, or kind of our daily life. One thing was a tin cup. Once you had your hands on a tin cup, you didn't get rid of it. And in order to have it available to you at all times, you would tie it around your waist with a string. So anytime you had a chance to drink something, your, your cup is right at the ready. He said, the other thing many of us prisoners had, once we got our hands on it, we would keep it, was a breadboard. A piece of wood measuring about this big, maybe uh, four inches by eight inches or so. And in the morning, you'd line up in your barracks and the block out tester, who was the uh, prisoner in charge of each barracks, one of his jobs, one of his duties was to dole out your daily bread ration. You know, you'd hold out your bread board, you'd get half a loaf, a third of a loaf, a quarter of a loaf, whatever it might be of black bread. What you did with it after that is up to you, whether you ate it all or saved it or bartered it. At lunchtime, when they brought food out, if you wanted to eat off of something, if you didn't have bread board, you were kind of out of luck. And these bread boards were so ubiquitous among these prisoners that the guards really didn't pay that much attention to them. And nonsense is I realized that I could take my breadboard and go to one of my friends who worked in the carpentry shop who had access to some tools and have him split open my breadboard and hollow out the inside of it. And I would put the pages in the hollowed out portion. And when it was filled, I'd glue it back together, sand it. No one would be any wiser than anything had been done to it. And at the end of the war, he and five of his closest friends walked out of the camp with their breadboards, German guards, and through those six breadboards, they were able to smuggle out the entire German portion of the diary. And here is a picture, you know, let me uh, skip over that for a second. Here is a picture of a breadboard. And as you can see, this is not Nansen's breadboard. Nansen's is actually on display in Norway's World War II Museum. And if you look at this, especially the right-hand image here, you can see that the paper that he wrote on was like tissue paper, um, very, very thin, so that he could pack a lot of pages into a very, very small cavity. What's not so apparent in looking at this picture is that his handwriting is microscopically small. It's so small that when they took these pages and transcribed them for publication back in 1947 in Norway, the diarist needed uh, magnifying glasses just to read his handwriting. What's also interesting, if you look at these two pages, these two representative pages, is you can see there's practically not a single word scratched out. Nansen had one of these incredible abilities, much like his father, Fritjof Nansen, again, to visualize exactly what he wanted to say and then say it, and didn't go back and revise it, didn't, didn't change his mind. And he says in the diary, when he published it, he says, I have not changed a single word in this diary. In fact, if I have spelled a person's name wrong, I've left it that way. That's how, how accurate this diary is, the printed diary is to what I actually wrote. And so that's how Nansen was able to preserve the entire German portion of his diary. And this diary has practically everything in it. You know, it has tragedy, it has pathos, 
It has humor, believe it or not, there are instances of humor in it. Uh, and of course it has its share of horror. I mean, it is an eyewitness account, as I say, of the Holocaust as it's occurring. But to me, the power of this diary is the power of nonsense example that shines through. It's the example of a man who somehow keeps his humanity in the most inhumane conditions mankind has ever conceived of. You know, Nansen could have walked right by Tom Bergenthal. He could have ignored him just like every other prisoner had ignored Tom Bergenthal. He could have said to himself quite, quite justifiably, this kid has like a one in a million chances of surviving. I mean, he's, he's young, he's injured, he's had toes amputated, he's Jewish. I mean, that combination is practically signing his own death warrant. Why should I get involved with him? But Nansen didn't do that. Nansen couldn't ignore him. And so I began my story tonight telling you about Tom Bergenthal and how he ended up from Auschwitz and ended up leaving Auschwitz and, and entering Sachsenhausen. So let me kind of come full circle, complete the story, and tell you what became of him. Now, obviously, he survived the end of the war. He was liberated on April 22nd, 1945, when Sachsenhausen was liberated. His mother survived in another concentration camp, a camp called Ravensbrück in Germany. His father did not make it. He died of pneumonia in January 1945 in Buchenwald, just, just months before the camp was liberated. And it would take Tommy and his mother another year and a half, 18 more months after the war finally ends, to even locate each other. I mean, by this time, war-torn Europe is a complete mess. Nobody knows where anybody is. Tommy doesn't know where to begin to look for his mother. His mother doesn't know where to begin to look for him. But ultimately, they do reunite. She, his mother finds him, believe it or not, in a Jewish orphanage outside of Warsaw. She takes him back to Germany to raise him. That's, after all, where she had grown up, she was familiar with. Now, you have to remember, until Tommy is liberated in the spring of 1945, he is completely illiterate. Tommy has never been in a classroom in his entire life. He's been a prisoner since he was five years old, since the fall of 1939. And at one point, Nansen asks him, well, why don't your parents teach you how to read and write? I mean, you didn't have to go to school for that. And he explains, Tommy explains patiently to Ad Nansen that, well, yeah, to get when I was together with my mother and father in the Kielce ghetto in Kielce, uh, Poland, it was a capital crime for Jewish parents to teach their children how to read and write. My parents could have been shot for doing that. So Tommy's had no education whatsoever. And when his mother gets him back to Germany, she hires a tutor. She says to the tutor, I want you to teach my son in one year, 12 months, everything that he should have learned in grades one through seven. So at the end of that one year, I can enroll him in the eighth grade, which is the grade that he would have been in and should have been in had he been a normal child in Germany going through the normal progression. So Tommy has um, a tutor for a year at the end of which, of course, he's enrolled in the eighth grade. He then goes to the ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade. He starts the 11th grade. He's now a, a teenager. He's 16 years old. And he's starting to think about his own future, his own life. And the one thing he knows is he doesn't want to spend it in Germany. So he decides to emigrate from Germany. And he has an aunt and uncle who live in Patterson, New Jersey. So he emigrates to Patterson, New Jersey. He arrives in December, 1951. Now think about this. He arrives in the United States, a country he's never been in, to meet an aunt and uncle he's never met, where he now is a, in the middle of his junior, academic junior year at a high school where all the subjects are taught in English. He's only had three and a half years of any education at this point, only three and a half years of English. Tommy only spoke Polish and German before the war. And now he's, as I said, in the middle of a school year. Well, he finishes high school in Patterson. He goes on to a small liberal arts college called Bethany College in West Virginia. And four years later, he graduates as the valedictorian of his class. At that point, Tommy goes to NYU Law School. He gets a legal degree, a JD. He then goes on to Harvard Law School and gets a master's degree and a doctorate in the field of international human rights. 
a field he said that he chose based on the example of odd nonsense. And Tom goes on to one of the most spectacularly successful careers of human rights that you can imagine. He wins every accolade possible. And that career culminates in the year 2000 when Tom is appointed to the International Court of Justice. Here's a picture of Tom in his judicial robes on the International Court of Justice. Tom is now 86 years old. He's living in retirement outside of Washington, D.C. in Chevy Chase. He's a delightful man. I just spoke to him last weekend. I had to pass on actually some, some sad news. Our mutual friend, Marit, the, the daughter of Odd Nansen, who was born in uh, Brooklyn back in 1928, she just died about a week and a half ago, age 92. But I, I've become very close with Tom Bergenthal. In fact, this version of the diary, which was dedicated by Nansen to Tom Bergenthal back in 1947, Tom has now written a preface for 70 years later. He's kind of come full circle and repaid the, the favor. So I'm going to leave you with one final diary entry. Before I do that, I'll pull up my website here and, and, and uh, urge you, if you're interested, to visit my website. I have blogs. I have interviews. Also, if you're interested, you can always write to me with questions. I know there's going to be a Q&A after this, um, but if you want to write to me uh, by my email, I've listed that uh, address as well. So the diary entry that I'm going to leave you with, I think kind of sums up everything that I've tried to convey to you tonight about the man uh, that I've spoken about. The date of this diary entry is March 5th, 1945. Nansen goes to Tommy and he says, Tommy, I've got some really bad news to share with you. I've just learned that I'm going to be moved from Sachsenhausen to yet another concentration camp, this one called Neuengamme, located in Hamburg. And I've thought of every possible way to take you with me. But of course, that's impossible. So you have to promise me that after this war is over, that you'll write to me and tell me how you made out. And Tommy's response, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, is kind of along the lines of, yes, yes, of course I'll do that. After all, I consider it to be my duty. And Nansen is so struck by the fact that this young 10-year-old child that he's talking to uses this word duty, that he kind of riffs off of this in this diary entry that he writes. And you have to remember, when I read you this diary entry, at the time Nansen's writing this, he doesn't know when the war is going to end. He's kind of given up. We're uh, wondering, he says, the, the war isn't going to end, it seems, until the last German soldier is finally shot and, and killed. It just, they'll, they'll, they just seem, seem to be incapable of giving up. He doesn't know whether Neuengamme is going to be worse than the camp he's been in, Sachsenhausen. In fact, when he gets to Neuengamme, he says it's much worse here. He says, if death stalked the streets of Sachsenhausen, it galloped in Neuengamme. He doesn't know whether he's going to continue to get these food parcels from the Red Cross, because at this point, the, not, the Allies are bombing literally everything that moves during the day in Germany. And without those Red Cross food parcels, Nansen's going to be reduced like everybody else is to a, to a skeleton. And yet with all that weighing on him, just listen to these words, how eloquent they are, how compassionate, how hopeful they are about Tommy. And knowing what we know about Tommy's subsequent 60-year career, how prophetic these words turn out to be. And this is what he writes. <clears throat> Little Tommy, if only your fellow creatures thought a fraction as much about their duty to you as you do about yours to them, all your prospects would be brighter than they are today. Thank God you don't realize that. And may you never come to realize the abyss of vile injustice that has been done to you. May there be such a future in store for you that all this frightful, this unintelligible cruelty will be expunged from your mind. May you discover that life is not like that. The world is not as it looked to you from the floor of the cattle car when you cried because you were so terribly cold. May you one day grasp and experience its richness in all the warmth and joy, all the beaming light that are reflected in those big eyes of yours, too shrewd for a child's, and which are a reminder and evidence of what you are meant to be. Thank you for allowing me to share my story of Ad Nansen and Tom Bergenthal as part of your Yom HaShoah commemoration. Thank you very much. I'll close off the screen. 
And I know that Fred is going to uh, let me know if there are questions, which I'd we, be happy to answer. This is my favorite you, part. Thank you so much, Tim. You, you again, this is the third time I'm seeing you outstanding. Uh, we really appreciate it. We do have some questions in the queue. The first one from Ken Novell, uh, did prisoners Odd Nansen and Tom Bergenthal, uh, the 10 year old boy ever meet up again? Uh, great, great question, great question. Well, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, Tommy finally meets up with his mother in December of 1946. And when he meets her, he says to her, Muti, uh, the reason why I'm alive today is because a Norwegian man saved my life when we were together in oh Saxonhaus. Unfortunately, he says to his mother, at this point, I can't remember his name anymore. Now remember, Tommy is illiterate. Even if he saw Nansen's name, he wouldn't recognize it. In, in those 18 months, Tom Bergenthal has probably gone through more life experiences than most you and I would go through in decades. And so it seems like that's kind of where the story is, is gonna end, the dead end. Until Tommy's mother reads in a refugee newspaper about how a Norwegian has just published, this is now in 1947, how he's just published his diary in Norway. And that diary covers 18 months of his incarceration as a prisoner in Sachsenhausen. And that book, that diary from day to day it's called, was the number one bestseller in Norway in 1947. So Tommy's mother suggests, why don't you write to this man? Maybe he can help you find the man that you're looking for. So Tommy pens a letter to Mr. Odd Nansen. Mr. Nansen, I understand that you were in Sachsenhausen and that you've now published a diary and um, of your uh, experiences in Sachsenhausen. And you, in fact, may be the person who saved my life. I don't remember anymore. I was that young boy in the Riviere with the amputated toes. And if it's not you who saved me, maybe you can find out among your Norwegian friends who that person might be. So I can now send him a, 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 an appropriate thank you. And he takes this letter, puts it in an envelope and he addresses the envelope, Mr. Odd Nansen, Norway. That's it. He, of course, he has no address for this guy, mails okay. it off. And either Nansen, number one, is as famous as I think he is, or number two, the Norwegian post office, postal service is pretty darn good. But the letter gets to Tommy, gets to Odd Nansen. And Tommy writes, this is all in his memoir. He writes, a week's go by and one day there's a knock on my door and I go to the door of the apartment and there are some Norwegian soldiers staring at me. Now the city he was living in, Gerdigen, was part of the British occupation zone and they used Norwegian soldiers as part of their occupation force. So these soldiers ask him, uh, is this the Bergenthal residence? And Tommy says, yes. And he says, well, we've got a, a parcel to deliver to you. And he says, these soldiers go to the back of this army truck and take off this enormous wooden crate and they lug it in, take several men just to carry it into their apartment. They put it on the floor, they take a crowbar and they pry the top of this crate off. And Tommy says, I, I, I peer into this enormous crate and I see that it's filled with chocolates and sardines and cheeses and all the food you can't get in, in you know, rationed uh, post-war Germany. And on the very top of this package is a letter written of course in German because that's how Nansen communicated with Tommy that begins, my lieber, lieber Tommy, my dear, dear Tommy. And Nansen flew down to Germany, flew down to Gerdigen, met with Tommy's mother for the first time, took Tommy back to Norway to live with him by the fjord for a couple of months so he could get his strength back. And Nansen and Tommy remained close friends for the rest of their lives until Nansen died in June of 1973. So thank you for, for that question. That's a good one. Great, great. Uh, next question uh, from Howard Glazer. He and his wife were in Sachsenhausen, and uh, they learned that uh, Sachsenhausen was later uh, was one of the earlier camps, and it was later modeled. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yes, Sachsenhausen was built, I believe, in 1936. So it's one of the first, if not the first, camp constructed. I think Dachau might have been even earlier, and the. Germans built it with the idea that this would be their model of all their concentration camps that they would build. And it, it reminds one of basically of a kind of a major league baseball park in the sense that it's like a diamond. 
and the front gate is is down here at the bottom of the ape the bottom of this apex and all of the barracks are all lined out in a fan shape and the idea was that the guard standing right at the corner could look out and see every single barracks from where they were now as it turns out the germans soon realized that this model that they had created wasn't scalable in the sense that once they built it, they couldn't keep expanding because of the way they designed it. Nice. So they kind of abandoned that as their floor plan for future prisons and went on to other, used other models. Uh, and of course, Auschwitz is much, much larger and is built in a completely different way. Um, so it, it was a model, but it was discarded because the, the Germans found themselves um, holding so many more prisoners than they had originally anticipated. They had Russian POWs, of course, uh, the Holocaust, they, they, the, the Jews, the resistance fighters, uh, you name it, you know, homosexuals, Jehovah Witnesses, all these people ended up in these different prisons. And I think after the um, war, it was used because of the way Germany was uh, split up after World War II, it was used by the Soviets as a POW camp um, housing German soldiers for a number of years. Um, it's a very, in my mind, I've been there as well. Um, I know what it's like. And it's, to me, a very, very creepy place. You get a very bad vibe. Um, interestingly, if you go and read all the different information panels in the different parts of the uh, camp, many of them are illustrated with the illustrations that Nansen drew and that are part of from day to day. There's about 40 sketches in the diary itself. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. And the, the pictures that are in the book are amazing. They really add a lot to the story and a lot to the diary. Uh, Mark Abrams uh, visited Soxtenhausen as well about 20 years ago. Okay. And he wants to know if you've had the opportunity to visit there. Yes, as I mentioned, I I've, I've been there, oh gosh, I'm going to say back in 2016 or so. It was before the, the book was published. Um, and I flew directly to Germany and from Germany, then I would, I flew up to Oslo and met with uh, Marit Nansen's daughter, uh, who was a font of, of information, helped me immeasurably. And, and what struck me more than anything else was just how small this camp was. I mean, just when you think of thousands, tens of thousands of prisoners packed into these um, uh, barracks, it, it just must've been like an anthill. I visited, this was October, uh, at the time. And what I did, there's in the, and again, in this kind of this apex where my, where my nose is in relationship to these two walls is the parade ground is where they would stand for roll call. And I was there, I was very well dressed. I had a fleece jacket on and, you know, heavy boots. And I stood in that roll call plaza. And I would say after maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I was completely numb. I, I had to go into the gift shop and order some hot tea just to kind of get my blood moving again. And when I think about these descriptions that Nansen talks about where sometimes they would be kept at roll call for 24 hours straight through the winter until people just died of exhaustion or froze to death. It, it really brought home to me just how unbelievably miserable it must have been. Thanks for sharing that. I, I can tell you that my father tells a similar story of when someone escaped from Theresienstadt and they made the entire camp come out of the barracks and they made them stand uh, the entire time until they found this prisoner out in the woods. Yes. Uh, it, overnight, it was a terrible, terrible ordeal. Yes. Um, and my father tells that story not with a lot of happiness. No, uh, I can as imagine. You, as you can imagine, yes. Yes. Uh, there was a, there's a question here from Chaz Seal. Uh, Tim, would you explain why the book originally went out of publication? Well, that's a good question. And since I wasn't alive back in 1949, I'm not 100% sure, but I can speculate. And I think it was one of these cases of bad timing. Because based on my research, I've looked through the old New York Times uh, reviews going back to the late 1947s. If you look at the books that made the New York Times bestseller list in 1946, it's Churchill's memoir, it's uh, MacArthur, or, you know, his, his writings, 1948, it's Eisenhower's memoir, um, you know, another war book. By 1949, there's not a single war-related book on the New York Times bestseller list. 
it was a case of, I think, war fatigue. You know, people were kind of mentally moving on. They were trying to get on with their lives and revisiting a concentration camp diary, especially by 1948, was probably in disfavor because by then, believe it or not, the roles had been reversed. Now the Cold War has started and the Soviet Union is our, our hated enemy. And who's our ally at that point? But the Germans. And in fact, in 1948, the Americans are cheering on the Berlin airlift as we're bringing supplies to these doughty you know, Germans who are standing up to the, to the Soviets in surrounded uh, Berlin. So if Nansen's diary, I think, had come out in America in 1946 or 47, I think it would have been completely different. But by 1949, that interest had fallen off. I also think the fact that Nansen was not American, he, he, he couldn't go on book tours or didn't go on book tours to the United States, uh, had something to do with it. Um, and interestingly, in my research, I learned that you know, um, Night by Elie Wiesel, which has gone, you know, is not 10 million copies have been printed. When it first came out, the first print one was 3,000 copies, and it took Wiesel three years to sell 3,000 copies. When Primo Levi first came out with Survival in Auschwitz, his memoir, again, nobody bought it in the 1950s. There really wasn't that much interest in the Holocaust. It really wasn't, again, almost until the, uh, was it the NBC series, the miniseries on the Holocaust? It wasn't until 1960 when you have Eichmann's trial that people again began to uh, express and, and pursue some interest in uh, the Holocaust. And so I, I think it's just a case of bad timing. Why it completely disappeared is still a mystery to me. You know, why it didn't even show up among academic books who would, you would think would search this out as a primary source. But more than any other reason, I'm just glad it's back in print now so that it'll never be forgotten, hopefully, uh, the way it was for the last 60 years. Absolutely. Tim, that was the last question that we received. Thank you so much again for spending the time with us uh, on this Yoma show a day and, and sharing Adnan's story. Uh, I'd like to turn this over to Brian Emery now and he'll close the uh, event for the evening. Terrific. Tim, wow, what a presentation is all I can say. I think we all feel lucky to have someone like you that cares to continue with this type of research and bringing it to our attention. On behalf of the Temple Bethel Brotherhood and congregants, I wanna thank you for sharing this historic, engaging and heartfelt presentation. For those of you who may have an interest in further reading, uh, the story about Odd Nansen uh, the book From Day to Day, One Man's Diary of Survival in a Nazi Concentration Camp. You can order that from Tim's website, www.timvoice.com. I'd like to mention that 50% of the sales, uh, or yes, 50% of the sales, the royalties go to support the uh, U.S., Holocaust Museum, and 50% go to the Norwegian Center for the Study of the Holocaust. So I would like to thank everyone this evening for your participation. I wish you all good health and good evening. Great. Well, thank you.